this stuff. Uh, sorry, by the way, about the room not being able to accommodate everybody. Unfortunately, because of the end of the year reviews, practically all the rooms in the school are being used in the morning. And, uh, in a sense, it's great that there are so many people, but it's not the most comfortable space, I suppose. Uh, I want to welcome Teddy Cruz. It's a great pleasure to have you here. After many, many attempts, we have tried many times to get Teddy today. Uh, very recently, in February, many of you were here for the one day symposium on design and political engagement in the form of system. And uh, as you would know, there's a Ted was one of the speakers then, but in the last moment, Ted we had an emergency and could not come. And finally, we managed to arrange because he was having to long days for him to be here with us today. You probably would have seen that, in fact, the idea today was to have another person that was going to participate in the symposium in February, and who again was going to be involved in. Uh, today and was going to join us, which I then see Brown from the new school in New York. And unfortunately yesterday afternoon we were informed that the immigration uh, <coughs> office delayed a visa and uh, many of you are quite familiar with the problems of visa. <laughs> and what's uh, the US <laughs> even though she is a uh, assistant professor and a professor in America and everything else, but they delayed her visa so that she could be with us. Uh, in a sense, when we thought of this event uh, with Vijayans and Ted, the idea was to give continuity to the symposium to be organized in February, which is very much connected to the work of a small research class that we created in the school uh, more than a year ago on architecture, urbanism, and informal system, in coordination with the Housing and Urbanism Master Plan. <coughs> and in that uh, occasion, uh, we introduced, and I spoke at, I'm not going to repeat here, a longer uh, presentation that tried to give a sense of why a cluster on the subject within the AA and what is the agenda of the cluster, what are the central questions that we are trying to address, what are the central questions that we proposed for that symposium and for the work of the cluster uh, uh, for the future. Perhaps in a very telegraphic manner, just to put this into the context of the work of the cluster, I would say one thing that we explain in more detail there, and many people actually have asked, is why the AA is involved on this subject, for many people it was a bit surprising. And uh, the fact of the matter is that there are many reasons, as I tried to explain at the end, is that uh, not least the fact that issues of informality became entirely constitutive of the urban, urban condition everywhere in the developed and developed world, uh, that urbanists, uh, planners dealing with uh, cities almost anywhere have to confront the question of the City. But also because we consider within the A, within Housing and Urbanism very much, and within the cluster, that in a sense addressing the informal uh, from the point of view of the design disciplines is a way of rethinking the discipline of urbanism itself, in that the informal presents massive challenge to the tradition of traditions of urbanism of uh, urban design and in fact cannot be addressed by those traditions and the traditional tools of master planning, land use planning, etc. etc. So for us, the question of addressing issues of design and reform is also a way of trying to rethink the discipline itself and the tools and methodology, methodologies of uh, urban design. There was a third reason that I said in February, uh, it's perhaps less known, but extremely important for us. And it's that, in fact, the AA has been perhaps one of the single most important schools of architecture, institutions really, involved in the shaping of ideas 
about the question of informal, informal housing, informal city, uh, informal urbanism, uh, uh, informal settlements. From the work in the late 50s, even 60s, the work of Otto Konensberg, John Turner, Hans Hans, uh, Joe Badensi, uh, a very long list uh, uh, of, uh, of people, Pat Wakely, Baba Mundus, Jeff Payne, Rod Burgers, I'm sure I'm missing several others that, in fact, played quite an important uh, role in that shaping of ideas and agendas and strategies for the And a lot of that work initiated here and then moved somewhere else. I have heard several colleagues from UCL, from the Development Planning Unit, for, for instance, where many of those people moved to what the hands were to start with, John, Bank, Lambert, etc. Et so there is a long history of connection between the AA and the production of ideas and the formulation of strategies to deal with people. What is also interesting is that in many ways the AA both contributes to the development of ideas but also uh, suffer of many of the shortcomings that became apparent in this field of debate and in the formulation of strategies. Though, uh, in particular in relation to one question which might be surprising in the context of the School of Architecture is that in the view of the work we do now and the research cluster, we would say that in many ways the work the AA did at the time was very important in many respects but also contributed to what we believe became one of the fundamental shortcomings in addressing the question of informal, what we call the deep specialization of the debate on informality. Uh, we have by now practically 40 years and even a bit more of policies, of strategies shaped by those ideas and agendas produced in the 60s, 70s, etc. etc. Et the strategies to deal with the informal, which have systematically failed, profound failure of reaching the scale of the inform anywhere of reaching the scale of the social need associated with conditions of informality. The conditions for that are many, it's too complex, we don't have the time to discuss it. But as an hypothesis that we present for our debate there, and as an hypothesis that we have been working with in the research class, is that one contributing factor to those failures has been the continuous deep specialization of the debate. The question of the inform became much more a question related to politics of the city, social process, economic questions, etc., etc., as if this spatial dimension was not relevant, certainly not central in that analysis, but not even present as part of both the diagnosis of situation as well as formulation of strategies. And we believe that that contributes greatly to the poverty of responses to the inform. Yet, on a more optimistic uh, uh, line, uh, we believe that from the mid-90s onwards, perhaps early 90s, mid-90s, there is uh, no, the emergency of a new generation of ideas, of strategies, of practices, that in many ways uh, uh, look in much more challenging, more complex ways, issues of informality, but also uh, a, a new generation of ideas and practices that fundamentally reconceptualize this question of the scale and the scaling up. What it means really to the scale up, to the scale of the informal, to the scale of social needs, to the scale of the city. And uh, in a reconceptualization of scaling up, where to put in a nutshell, I would say that is the idea that scaling up becomes a much more complex, much more multiple, multidimensional multi-sectorial, multi-programmatic, multi-scalar process. A process that points towards a fundamental uh, change in the quality of the city, rather than scaling up being fundamentally an issue of multiplication of, uh, a quantitative question of multiplication of, of, uh, uh, of projects and programs to deal with informal. And that reconceptualization of scaling up we said in our view became also associated not accidentally with a new understanding of the project, the project for the form, the urban project that addressed conditions of informality. And uh, at the core of that reconceptualization, a new understanding of the articulation of the project 
with the surrounding circumstances, with the surrounding conditions, and the relation between project and city. And we also add that together with this reconceptualization of scale, the scaling up, new ways of understanding the project came not accidentally a revisiting of questions of space and design that from the mid-90s we would say re-emerges as a central dimension in the discussion. And again, we don't have the time to go over that, but we try to identify a variety of an expectation of approaches to the question of design and the role of design disciplines in addressing the form. The, uh, and the spectrum of uh, responses to this question of the project, the design of projects for inform, where we have some kind of micro projects that have no ambition of any great systematic change at the level of the city, to projects that are operating at very different scales, from very micro acupunctures to intermediate scale to large to very large scale, they have in common this search for articulating projects with surrounding conditions in the city in ways that can fundamentally scale up to the dimension of the form, to the dimension of social needs, to the dimension of the city. What we said, and that's I think the main reason why the cluster emerged, is that in our view we have now accumulated almost 20 years of a very rich uh, spectrum of experiences all over the world, particularly in the developing world, of uh, designing for the informal city, designing for the city, redesigning the relations between informal and formal. And uh, that unfortunately, and we were talking with Ted a short while about that, even though there is a very rich experience, there is almost no systematic appraisal of that experience. There is very little then in terms of systematically analyzing what we have learned in 20 years of very different experiences, very different skills of intervention, very different understandings even, even those that value design, value in different ways, and see the role of design in different ways. You know? And so in a sense, the work of the class is an attempt to start you know, contributing to this kind of more systematic appraisal of where we are, what is the role of architecture, the role of urbanism, the role of design, not as a magic solution, but one central element in addressing the question of the form, the multiple articulations of the multiple informalities with the form. And we set up a series of questions that have guided the work of the classes so far, and that were at the core of the uh, symposium we had in February, which I would put basically on a few questions that are fundamentally about this question of the role of design in the scaling up to the scale of the inform, the scaling up to the scale of social needs, the scale of the city. But also very importantly, the specificity of designing in and with the inform. What does it mean? Is it really different in what ways, what tools, what instruments, what methodologies, you know, or is it just design, as other design, as we know, practice in any uh, uh, circumstance within the urban context. We believe it's not, and that's part of the, the research that we have been doing. I would say uh, um, a third very central question to the work of the class is this issue of design as research. How can, this is again something that Vijay Yancy Rao has uh, written uh, quite a lot about, is the contribution of design disciplines for the research, the analysis, the understanding about the informal and about the multiple informalities in the city. And we believe that this also poses very uh, important challenges for us, how to understand design as research that can uh, give us greater insight about the informal. Another central question, and in the work we have been doing also within housing and urbanism, we have been paying quite a lot of attention to that, is the articulation of design with the question of the productivity of territory, which in our view is central to the issue of informality. When the defining factor of informality is not just its irregularity, it's also very much the very low productivity of the informal, the informal economy, the informal production of city, of habitat, of housing, etc. And the articulation of design and the economy of territory and the productivity of territory becomes central to the work we are doing in the past. And finally, I would say, the most important of all, which again uh, relates very much to the work of Ted, 
for us is to explore the articulation of design with what we call the redesigning of the political institutionalities, of the urban institutionalities, of the political institutional framework. That's what is at the very core of the question of reaching scale, the scale of the city. There's no reaching scale if there's no fundamental redesigning of the political institutions, of the regulatory frameworks. And it's that relation between design and redesign of political institutions that for us seems to be the most important challenge, in a way, perhaps the most difficult challenge, and which makes the whole work of trying to address the informal and informal city unavoidably, inexorably, profoundly political. It's all about politics. And I would say that then is one of the reasons that for a long time we have been trying to get that here because of the many very inspiring practitioners working uh, with informal and doing very interesting design work with informal, I would say all of them acknowledge the, the political dimension very explicitly, but perhaps Teddy, more than anyone else, has elaborated very much on this question of the politics of the process and how his work articulates the political process of the city with the political process of transforming cities, of transforming institutionalities, of creating institutionalities that can give account of that diversity of logics of production of the city, formal and informal. Institutionalities that can articulate those logics within the search for inclusive, democratic, socially just cities. And I think the work of Teddy is uh, absolutely uh, no, uh, one of the most challenging in terms of addressing those issues, and that's why we went to have him before, and that's why we're so glad to have him today. Um, Alex has uh, some more information to provide uh, uh, about Teddy before we pass the word to you. Since uh, Vijayant is, is not here, Rather than to have, as it was announced, a panel at the end with discussion, what we'll have after uh, Teddy finishes is just open up to the floor for questions and debate. Mm -hmm. Just to give a brief introduction to Teddy, Teddy Cruz has been recognized internationally for his urban research of the Tijuana and San Diego border, and in collaboration with community-based non-profit organizations for advancing new models of civic participation affordable housing and public infrastructure at the scale of neighborhoods. He received the prestigious Rome Prize in Architecture, was the first recipient of the James Sterling Memorial Lecture on the City Prize, and the Ford Foundation selected him recently for the Visionary Media Award, an important recognition given to few individuals worldwide for their innovative efforts on the front of key social issues. His work has been profiled in important publications, including the New York Times, Domus and Harvard Design Magazine. Most recently, he represented the US in the Venice Architecture Biennale, um, and his work was included in a small scale big change exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He is currently a professor in public culture and urbanism in the Visual Arts Department at the University of California, San Diego, where he founded the Center for Urban Politics. So, without further ado, I'd like to call Jonas and the host of our so much and, and, and thank you for being masochists and being here you know today it's like this wonderful weather outside I know that there is also the end of the term here and so it's, uh, it's especially nice that you were able to have some time to, you know, to, to be here I, I'm excited to share a, a variety of reflections based on the in particularly inspired by introduction by George and I hope I can add to the debate since I wasn't really uh, here for, for the symposium and, and taking advantage that the other person didn't, you know, wasn't able to enter your fabulous country, uh, she, uh, I, I added a couple of more images, okay, so I can uh, elaborate on a couple of stories. And in fact, that's what I'm interested in doing, is just really taking you through a series of reflections uh, that are pretty much, uh, that emerge from this very specific locality, which is the Tijuana-San Diego border, uh, where I have been working and living in the last years. And I think that it's good uh, that, that you set the tone, uh, George, and I, by the way, George, thank you so much for inviting me. I've been wanting to meet you, and finally, if, you know, if anything, there is an excuse to begin a relationship that uh, can be more, more meaningful in the, in the next years. Uh, but I'm glad you, you reminded us that the whole uh, desire here is to really engage the very current uh, 
situation at this moment. I mean, that there is an urgency at this very moment uh, to redefine our tools and to ultimately um, engage the possibility of transformation of the political institutional frameworks, as we call it. What role do we have as architects in engaging this particular uh, period of crisis? Uh, and I think this is, as many people have been noticing, an opportunity, nevertheless, to reflect on uh, uh, the possibility of redefining our own practices. So for me, uh, embedding the formal right away to begin with, since you mentioned it, in other types of interpretations is uh, fundamental, primarily from architecture where we've been reducing the informal as a mere aesthetic category. I think we need to be embedded again in a very political uh, uh, dimension, and, and, and that's what I'm attempting uh, actually to hopefully share with you in the context of my own work uh, at the uh, Tijuana San Diego border. One reflection, of course, has to do with a, a realization that I was, uh, that at some point I was interested in, in this notion of expanding, expanding uh, our modes of practice, that not, not all of us are interested in building buildings for a moment. Uh, but might be interested in extending our own ways of conceptualizing and managing certain complexity by engaging pedagogical models, by engaging uh, issues of uh, social organization, participatory models, uh, by engaging the very politics and economics of development. To what degree do we engage the very domains that have remained peripheral to design? And that to me was a challenge. Of course, hopefully only to return to design itself. I and mean, one of the most inspirational statements in the context of this expanded most of practice did not come in the last years, in fact, from an architect or a writer or a philosopher or a theorist that came from General Petraeus, when in fact uh, he came back, and I wanted to begin, uh, selected this just to begin uh, to set the tone a bit, but uh, when he came back from his first tour uh, uh, of Iraq, and war of Iraq, as he was a commander in chief, uh, then uh, I never forget when he came back to the U.S. and presented his report to Congress, uh, and uh, it was published in the New York Times, and he pretty much told uh, Congress, one of the first tenets of his review, uh, that the contemporary soldier needed to transform that the contemporary soldier could not continue being this robot-like figure that could control the war at a distance by a mere push of a button, uh, armed with every gadget and so on, that the, the contemporary soldier had to transform, and this was, was amazing, into an anthropologist, a social worker, and versed in many languages, he said. And then I, I asked myself, my God, if the contemporary soldier uh, needs to transform, mm -hmm. why can't we as architects, I, I asked myself. And in fact, I was reflecting on that, I said, maybe it's not uh, that uh, we need to become a social worker or anthropologists. After all, we, it's understood that from our own disciplinarity, we can really contribute and must contribute to the debate. But nevertheless, we might be able to borrow the procedures of the social worker or the anthropologist uh, to rethink our own tools of intervention of operation. And uh, the second part of his statement was even more compelling. He said the war was not uh, uh, fought at a distance, but out of the immediacy of relationship uh, to social networks, familial relationships at the scale of neighborhoods and, uh, and so on, uh, which implied for me the demolishing for a moment of our perennial obsession with autonomy, uh, uh, with a, a kind of idea of the avant-garde that has depended from our artistic fields on a critical distance from the institutions. Instead, he was proposing a critical proximity, uh, the immediacy of relationship to these uh, conditions. Well, of course, it's obvious that this begins to suggest not only the, over, the, the, the kind of obvious uh, hijacking of many of the concepts that were constructed theoretically and conceptually from uh, all of us in our field coming uh, from the left, if I can say so, if that, uh, those uh, terms uh, still exist, uh, many years ago. But somehow, for many of us, uh, those terms uh, remain a metaphorical uh, uh, tropes. And in fact, it is the, uh, the, the military establishment, but also the kind of right-wing sectors primarily in, at this time, at least in the United States, who have in fact co-opted and made those concepts incredibly operational, what we have remained we have, we have uh, 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 left them niched into some kind of exhibition uh, inside a gallery and so on. So I'm interested in the possibility of these detours that, in most, uh, 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 that we need to take in order to, uh, of course, return to the specificity of, of our work. Um, 
this to me has been essential in engaging the specificity of the political as embedded and inscribed in the territory of conflict, which is in fact the Tijuana San Diego border. The mere entering uh, physically, uh, not only in, in an embodied way, but also the revealing, the exposure, the visualization of conflict. Who has constructed that territory? Who are the institutions that are to be blamed for the stupidity of those collisions uh, at this uh, juncture, these uh, ge geographies of conflict? The radicalization of the local has been an especial concept or, or, or framework for uh, my practice. And of course, the, the local has uh, remained provincial to many institutions, and for me has been, obviously, in, in recent times, a tool uh, to, uh, again, visualize and expose these conditions. Primarily at the border zone, and I edited a few images, it would have been good to introduce you to the geography, to the landscapes, the contradictory landscapes between San Diego and Tijuana, but I want to add and many other stories I want to share with you. But suffice it to say that at this very juncture, uh, probably there is no other place in the world where you can find some of the wealthiest real estate as the one that you find in the periphery of San Diego, barely 20 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America. This radical proximity of wealth and poverty, of enclaves, of mega wealth, and sectors of marginality, which in fact, I could say in the last years of a glamorous economy of a neoliberal development, the ugly sister of neoliberalism was the shanty towns that were also exploding in tandem with the explosion of coal. Or to understand environmental crisis through global warming, global warming, environmental crisis, we must uh, uh, say uh, to begin with that while we understand that it's an environmental crisis, an economic crisis today, is primarily a as a point of departure, a cultural crisis, a crisis of the institutions unable to rethink themselves. At this very moment, when this polarity of wealth and poverty, where the very epicenter of production, or, or I should say of, uh, a, a, not production necessarily, but the explosion of the global city uh, everywhere in the last years have depended, uh, of course, on, the, on, a, on a migrant labor force uh, to, to support it. So this, again, relationship uh, has exposed uh, once and for all uh, that these last years of uh, uh, growth and development that has become sustainable also was produced by exclusive institutions. Uh, ultimately, I think for me this is an important point of departure. Here we can find maybe one of the many concepts I want to share with you about my interpretations of the informal. That maybe a new interpretation or conception of the political itself can be constructed here at the very moment of conflict where formal and informal conditions meet. Let's call it politics and economics of development, attitudes and so on. I don't know if you remember this image, the uh, fundamental image when I saw it as well, uh, uh, mainly because I've been in con conversation you know, with people uh, in the past in terms of these debates, uh, uh, such as Pierre Vittorio Aureli, for example, who at some point in the Berlaki Institute, he says, oh, I'm tired, he says, of talking about the bottom-up, top-down, you know. Uh, and I had to just almost uh, 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 scream, you know, like saying, well, let me tell you, I come from the place where the bottom up and the top down are separated by a quarter inch piece of steel. I think that when I found this image, I wanted to show it to Pierre Vittorio to say, this is it, look at this, a big hole, the, the foundations of the tower of con the luxury condos in, in, in the outskirts of Shanghai, uh, in the only remaining, uh, in the context of the only remaining house from the neighborhood, the neighborhood that was erased the house of this woman who decided to say no for a moment because after in the end the house was demolished. But is this image completely, again, renders visual. It really exposes and visualizes that conflict between the top down and the bottom up. I think to really uh, 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 sort of enable new interpretations of this relationship, of this conflict, is where uh, a new conception of the political might be uh, uh, created. So for me, conflict is a tool and has been a tool to rethink uh, these procedures. Conflict as a creative tool that can expose what is behind these artifacts, these images. This is a wall, by the way, uh, the, the actual border wall uh, that separates Tijuana and San Diego. Uh, and many times, uh, of course, uh, when one sees these types of artifacts, not only they represent the manifestation, the kind of solidification of global conflict in the territory itself, but this particular wall, uh, many times say, transforms San Diego in the United States into the largest uh, 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 gated community in the world. And 
for me it's essential to suggest this because in the last years this border wall has continued to harden. Uh, and in tandem we have also been noticing the hardening of social legislature uh, towards the city, uh, uh, of public institutions, the er erasure in fact in the United States primarily, I think now it's everywhere, primarily in Europe even more, in compelling ways, the erasure not only of social welfare and public institutions in the city, but the deployment, of course, of an urbanization that has also depended on those uh, fundamental instruments of division across jurisdictions, across communities. Obviously, an urbanization of fear that uh, has been uh, 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 enabled in the last years in tandem with this militarization of the border. So the informal, again, uh, for me, is uh, simply a way of reorganizing imposed political and economic agendas. And I think that, uh, already that suggests that one of the, the kind of uh, uh, main conditions, again, for me, of the informal embedding it in the praxis, not in an image, but in a set of procedures. So this act of transgression, this act of reorganizing those very conditions, uh, political and economic, uh, uh, are for me essential uh, and not only in rethinking our own tools, but also in visualis uh, visualizing and documenting many of the transborder flows uh, that are at play here in the Tijuana San Diego border that have been really inspiration for my practice. Uh, but not only, again, metaphorically, what is behind them? These transborder uh, uh, systems that in one direction move, mobilize people, the impact of immigrants in the United States, uh, as it is for any other city in the world, in one direction, and on the other, the transfer uh, of waste from San Diego, from Southern California into Tijuana. Those are two major flows that in the last years have been the kind of reference uh, for rethinking a variety of procedures. Uh, imagine that Tijuana, uh, Tijuana uh, has, begun, has been building itself in the last years with the waste of San Diego, in essence. Uh, so you have, for example, small post-war post bungalows uh, uh, that were in those older, let's say, Levittown subdivisions of the 50s. These small dwellings that now have become obsolete as developers in the United States have begun to demolish them in order to build mad mansions, inflated versions of Levittown. Uh, so these small dwellings are sold or given away to Mexican developers. These houses travel across the border. These are houses waiting, in fact, to cross the border. And once they cross into, San, into Tijuana, they are put on top of these metal frames, leaving the first floor to become the second, to be injected with more programming, uh, with other narratives. So this sort of close sandwich organization, as I call it, this sort of layering, this sort of fearless layering of programs, uh, and of recycling fragments from one city to another is very compelling to witness. Uh, not, not only houses, but also a, a pieces uh, uh, of infrastructure, uh, residues, debris from one city to another, uh, such as these rubber tires that in the past you've seen how they've been used as retaining walls, but look at what now people have been able to do in the context of socioeconomic emergency. They have figured out how to uh, utilize this object by peeling it off uh, clipping it and interlocking it to construct a more efficient, more functional retaining wall. Obviously, it's unavoidable to, to not uh, see these images and not think of the creative intelligence that is behind these kind of procedures. But uh, as a waiver, I should say I don't want to romanticize poverty, and I will explain why these images also are incredibly seductive. Uh, 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 not only because of, uh, uh, again, the way they look, but what they have been performing uh, across the political and economic frameworks. Uh, the garage doors uh, from Riverside and from any of the older, again, levy towns or subdivisions of Southern California are uh, imported into Tijuana en masse to construct uh, social housing in these shanty towns. Uh, these houses are entirely built, again, with garage doors with these fragments from uh, San Diego. So this layering, again, uh, of um, uh, this recycling, the city building itself with the waste of the other, pretty much. It sets these uh, shanty towns, these informal settlements, very much apart from maybe other ones in the world, uh, mainly because of this strange proximity between Tijuana and San Diego. Uh, but again, uh, for me, it's not only the... And I should, shouldn't be afraid at the same time to say that there is something fundamental, aesthetically speaking, I mean, in terms of the, the kind of architecture made of parts, uh, the re negotiation, of course, uh, with boundaries. There are a series of procedures, though, that I'm interested in translating from these dynamics. 
One particular phenomenon that for me is important is that uh, let's imagine that much of that waste comes from the older subdivisions, again from San Diego, so that in the last uh, 30 years, 40 years, uh, this waste has, uh, as this subdivision begins to dismantle themselves, this waste travels 20 minutes south to construct the new periphery of Tijuana. In a sense, Levittown, Southern California, Levittown, has been recycled into Tijuana's slums. I would love to elaborate further on this issue of Levittown because, as you remember, Levittown, as one of the first subdivisions in the world, was conceived as a factory under the sky in terms of this uh, manufacturing and standardization of constructive systems. And, and now, when this waste and these parts are transferred into Tijuana's slum, slums, of course, those slums are primarily factories of housing. Uh, as people build their own habitation. So this issue of production is an important one. But nevertheless, again, the point uh, uh, that I wanted to convey here is that behind these images, uh, again, there is an operative dimension of informality, the series of procedures uh, that, uh, are, uh, in, in, uh, that are engaged in the construction of this. And this is something that has been already obvious to the conversation of the informal, uh, uh, the negotiation of boundaries, uh, the negotiation with topography, with resources, levels of social organization that precede urbanization, sometimes in the shape of uh, a certain social control, sometimes out of pure activism in providing housing, uh, emergency housing. All I'm trying to suggest is that behind uh, these environments, more than just containing in seductive images of precariousness and lightness, there are fundamental and very sophisticated procedures. Here, again, the informal becomes a praxis, a, a, a series of uh, actions, a series of um, um, a processes that I think, for me, it is essential to suggest we need to elevate, as George Porter was saying earlier, not only to rethink those particular localities, but as devices to scale up in the reframing of those political institutions. We need to translate. We need to engage a, the raising of the kind of sophistication behind these procedures. Uh, a, and we, as I think in our own profession, we can become interlocutors to produce that uh, possibility. In essence, behind these images, there is a political economy, political economy of waste that, that as one first, I want to share a series of procedures now uh, that I've been noticing, that I've been trying to articulate in the last years. One is that the political economy of waste it's obvious that behind this recycling, there is an economy essential to the sustainability of these environments. These garage doors are sold. They are distributed. They are, there is part of a kind of shaping of a particular local public policy, if we can call it that, even if invisible. Political economy pertains as a field in the shaping and the constructing of public policy and the kind of uh, enabling of uh, uh, conditions of, uh, of production and of regulation to really uh, uh, be brought into the shaping, again, of identity at that very scale. So the houses, the parts are sold as part of the economy. Uh, this plug-in economy is essential because we must, in a sense, as we engage in formal, also suggest the relocating of the means of production. These environments are sites of production. They are not urbanizations of consumption. As, of course, uh, the global city uh, as we as architects became so infatuated with the global city as, as an epicenter, let's say, of consumption and display, where architecture became the iconographic tool to uh, catapult these environments uh, to be uh, uh, that, uh, these marginal environments remain, in fact, sites of production. So I'm, uh, uh, that would be another aspect, I think, here as a concept, the kind of confrontation of consumption and production. I think we need to re engage. The city is primarily the locus uh, of productivity, culturally, and of new social economic relations. So I mean, I'm interested in using, of course, or interpreting the informal to rethink property itself, to rethink ownership in this case. And one thing that has been essential to the understanding of these slums where we've been working in the last years is that here in the negotiation of natural, let's call it for a moment natural, because we know that that's a conflictive topic, it's not to say it's just purely natural, many of these environments are artificial, but let's say natural boundaries uh, and jurisdictional ones. Uh, the confrontation of jurisdiction 
and topography. Uh, this begins to re enable the, re the reimagining of property. But uh, let me explain what I mean by that. In many of these slums, uh, the artificial jurisdictional arbitrary lines that are rendered to construct or to, to uh, envelope what is loosely called neighborhoods. These are the lines uh, <coughs> drafted, let's say for a moment, inscribed by land title agencies who, you know, when uh, squatters uh, invade the land in Mexico, this is a, a longer story and I'm just giving you impressions because we would I, would I would love to talk to you about the process by which squatting happens and so on. Very different from India to all the places in Latin America. Mexico has pro protection uh, of squatters because of its uh, agrarian land reform coming from the revolution in the early uh, part of the 20th century, etc. Nevertheless, when squatters invade the land, a process begins uh, of negotiation between them and certain land title agencies to give them property deeds and money is exchanged for a small infrastructure. Uh, but nevertheless, the jurisdictional boundaries of those environments are very arbitrary, colliding with the natural ones. We all know that many of these shanty towns are occupied canyons, uh, micro basins, watershed systems, high risk zones, etc. So again, one potential uh, framework here as a procedure is, is an interesting possibility uh, to rethink uh, the, conf the conflict between natural boundaries and jurisdictional ones. Can we reimagine the micro basin as a neighborhood? This is one of the first provocations that we made to the government in Tijuana, and I think it's a very, very uh, compelling one. Can we redefine what constructs a community or a neighborhood, less driven by jurisdictional envelope and more by a natural and social economic systems? Uh, uh, so that produces another type of scale. And ultimately, once we might enable, I hope I'm not confusing you, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of characterization of a neighborhood based on its natural boundaries, hydrologically speaking, as a micro basin, can that specific community now <coughs> represent that micro basin? In other words, something essential here is new political representation. I think that it is already obvious that the formal systems of organization remain hugely exclusive. And part of the dilemma here in the context of our urgency today is to enable the opening of the spaces of inclusion. What other forms of representation can emerge to the management of resources and of social relations? So can this micro community be the, the form a council to represent and to manage and to take care of that particular micro basin? Uh, this new political representation is at stake here and I'm I am very excited to think that we as architects could become the designers, in fact, of such political representation, of the very political process by which uh, governance may be shaped, so that these uh, uh, other forms of governance uh, that can begin to thread uh, uh, from the local to a more <coughs> scaling up version of it. I think that's a, a very interesting. Uh, uh, can you hear me, by the way? I don't know if this. Uh, um, Another condition that emerges here is one of the, of course, obviously, the uh, temporal dynamics, right? The temporal socioeconomic dynamics that make these environments uh, uh, unfold through time. Uh, and, and still the question in many of these environments is while they are densifying themselves through that, uh, uh, those conditions of contingency, right? Self-built architecture and so on, to what degree they are supported either by government uh, injection of infrastructure, but also by, uh, by enabling another layer of development by people themselves. So how do we anticipate the density of these environments? Uh, so we've been working with a topic here that is an interesting one, where we, be we begin to identify many of the remaining empty spaces uh, of these environments, where we might begin to see a, an extra, let's say, density. Um, and instead of coming in, um, you know, uh, through a project of intervention that does not enable that participation, the idea has been can the four or five families that are part of this particular cluster, as they already are given money and infrastructure is given to them in the shape of retaining walls, stairways, can they, with their sweat equity, be participants, be co-developers of that particular cluster? Can they begin to build the extra units that might be rented or co-owned uh, by others? 
fundamental numbers. Mike Davis has written a lot about this. In these slums, uh, uh, people rent from others. There is an economy, of course, at play. Unfortunately, the problem is that that economy has remained a bit neoliberal in a sense. It's the Wild West, individuals for, in their own terms. To what degree we begin to assert levels of social organization, participation, a kind of uh, guarantees, social guarantees to produce levels of socioeconomic equity. So part of the idea has been that those four families might become co-developers of that cluster as they also uh, are enabled by community trust. This is, by the way, a process that we are engaging at this moment. These are just impressions that I'm sharing with you, but it's a very real project in terms of uh, changing the politics of this canyon. We have been succeeding in enabling a, a community trust to be the framework here, but also uh, the canyon now uh, has a council that represents that particular water uh, uh, basin, that micro basin. Uh, so in a sense, I'm just trying to uh, maybe speak of the obvious uh, to you already, uh, probably, that infrastructure is a differential system that mediates, not that, that uh, imposes, but mediates top-down and bottom-up dynamics in this case. Uh, something that Mike Davis mentioned about this, by the way, in, the, in his critique of Fernando de Soto, uh, was that uh, we cannot celebrate these environments as just being these epicenters of creativity only, because that would mean to lead them to their own devices. That's exactly what maybe Cameron's policies lately here in England have been proposing, in a sense. Uh, now it's up to you, communities, to, to call the shots. Well, guess what? We need help, right? So I think that while we, in fact, might be creative in reimagining uh, development, we also need infrastructure, we need, we need subsidies, we need a level of support. So this a countering of government and community, those scales, I think, is important here. Uh, I, I shouldn't really uh, stop to, I, I, there are other stories I need to share with you, but uh, convergence, the convergence of economic resources social contingency and natural boundaries. This is what is so exciting about these environments because every single register that we hear in these schools polarize and fragment in terms of our own specializations here are automatically, naturally converged, uh, conflated, uh, made op op operational. And of course, this is obvious uh, that because these environments really are part of a kind of vertical, layered kind of uh, a, 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 a organization, again, the top-down resources, the social contingency, and the natural converge in that particular contour. And I think I'm interested in articulating that uh, further. Another way of saying it probably is that just like it has been happening, I've been researching a lot, a lot of the Medellin case uh, and, and as part of our research, as probably many of you, because I think that there is probably no other progressive place in the world that, that this moment has uh, proven that by just shifting our gaze from the center to those marginal neighborhoods, investing forcefully almost in infrastructure and re-engaging other modes of participation, we can begin to reimagine all the ideas of public space and public institutions. But what has happened there, I think, has been as one of the concepts that for me has been essential in these uh, shanty towns, is that there is a simultaneous uh, uh, centralization and decentralization. What, what, what I mean is that just in Medellin, as uh, Sergio Fajardo convened and convert uh, uh, the, the institutions to reimagine themselves in a more integrated, holistic way, those resources are identified only to be decentralized in order to touch many of those marginal zones. So I think it's, it's an obvious topic that I wanted to say this because, again, very self often we operate out of this pendulum. But this sort of simultaneity of centralization and decentralization was a very, it has been a very interesting topic. Uh, so, can we, in fact, design, has been uh, another topic here, spatial and socioeconomic inclusion, which is another aspect that in Medellin, in the relationship of what we are trying to do in Tijuana, in this shanty towns, is very fundamental. In other words, how to design spaces, but in tandem to those spaces, designing the cultural and socioeconomic sustainability for those spaces. So for each library part, the institutions top down and bottom up realign themselves to produce a very clever and very smart project of uh, management to those spaces. Recently I heard, for example, that the Maxi Museum in Rome might have to close because they don't have any money for programming, uh, the, the site had been building, or I remember somebody showing me a concert hall, I don't know if uh, in, 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 in Scotland somewhere, the day it uh, opened, it closed. Because while the building was beautiful, 
nobody took care of how are we going to actually inject cultural programming in social economic, uh, who's going to maintain these spaces? See, we are trained to design beautiful spaces, but they never asked us who is going to take care of those spaces, what forms of governance, what political, economic procedures might be en enacted uh, to really uh, 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 make, uh, uh, maintain those spaces in the long term. So I'm interested in this correlation of space and management at the scale of those very specific localities in the shanty towns. In Tijuana, what has been essential for me then is to enter a conflict, as in many of our projects. It's almost as, as direct as that. Our interest is, okay, as we uh, begin to open up these uh, relationships, let's really question who are the institutions, who are the actors behind that conflict. The conflict that we selected in Tijuana is a conflict between factories, labor, and housing. Uh, as we discover that many of these maquiladoras, these factories, as you know, Tijuana is a city of factories, as many of those uh, tax haven uh, autonomous zones in the world where companies come, they don't pay that much in, in, in taxes uh, in order to maximize the access to cheap labor and so on. Uh, Tijuana is one of those places. In fact, it's a, it's a capital of televisions in the world. Most of televisions are assembled in Tijuana. So these factories place themselves next to the slums obviously to conveniently borrow labor uh, without uh, giving anything in return. And, and, and I, I already suggested this at the beginning of the, the talk, uh, the codependence, right, uh, of these centers of wealth uh, that have been depending on cheap labor, basically. But we never ask where those people live or what is the role, etc. I think those are two joint projects that need to be a constant question here. Uh, the ma uh, migrant labor uh, uh, force that is borrowed uh, but in this case, uh, our project became one of rethinking the site of intervention. I'm critical of the habitat of humanities of the world that just go to the place to build houses, thinking that just by like providing a roof, we're going to solve the problem, even though we must do that. But the point, I think, has to do, we need to get to the basis. This is what we were thinking. We need to go beyond shelter in thinking of social housing at the scale of the slum. We need to engage the unaccountable institutions enforcing some kind of debate. So we went to the factory instead. That was an obvious kind of detour uh, again. Uh, and we began to realize the amazing amount of resources that these factories have in Tijuana. Uh, first, we went to the Hyundai, uh, Hyundai factory, a Korean factory that produces car parts. And we realized that uh, it was difficult because it was too, they were too heavy, the parts. So we went to a Spanish maquiladora, which was perfect because I took advantage, how would you call it, a kind of colonizer's guilt, you know, and I, I entered into the Vapiladora, we had conversations, of course it helps to be part of an institution of the architectural association, so I am coming from my university in San Diego, officially represented, and we, we meet, and I convince uh, these people to let us enter into the factory, uh, and to open up a very simple, again, reflection. As factories borrow labor from these uh, uh, neighborhoods or communities, can the factories with their own systems of production, their own economies, their own manufacturing lines, manufacturing lines can provide infrastructure to plug into those environments, uh, uh, to be part of this system already that I very loosely uh, explained? And can the sweat equity of those workers themselves be part of the agenda in the kind of possibility of making them co-developers of their own housing? Uh, so in this triangulation, which for them was very, uh, at least uh, curious, they were very curious about it, we were given the opportunity to enter the factory and to realize the amazing amount of pieces, elements, parts that make these environments is, 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 is an interesting site of intervention. Uh, so the factory became the place to propose. In fact, we've been designing, uh, chose by tweaking very lightly, cleverly, what already exists, a lightweight system such as this uh, a space frame that is made of parts that does not need welding uh, to span uh, uh, large uh, distances uh, and that can be built very uh, efficiently by people uh, to create uh, these uh, parts that can be, again, acting as a kind of acupunctural systems, again, that can simply frame and uh, 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 reorganize the, the existing. Or maybe this uh, gutter beam that obviously inspired by uh, Jean Prouvet, for example, uh, in taking the beam as a kind of furniture uh, can the beam not only be structural, but be also a water collection uh, system. Uh, so uh, we began to basically propose a series of parts. 
if I was to take you in, in, in a tour, which I do often of these shanty towns, it's obvious that what they need are columns to retrofit into jack houses that are about to collapse, beams, retaining walls, stairways. This is obvious. But in some way, unfortunately, even Brazil, where the, the whole attitude of refurbishing or restructuring these laws has been part of the political agenda at this moment, unfortunately, many of those infrastructural systems remain very one dimensional. One aspect of this environment that is amazing is that these infrastructures are promiscuous. So it's not just a retaining wall that retains, but it can serve the purpose of something else. What else can these things be is something that is uh, very interesting. Uh, and, the, and the piece that maybe is the most uh, uh, um, clear one is using, in fact, the pallet racks that they use in this factory. They produce these lightweight pallet racks that are exported all over the world. And similar to those tire walls where they thread the waste, we wanted to continue that conversation by producing other systems that can help and support the threading of the garage doors and other uh, systems. So the linking, again, obviously, of material practices uh, with uh, sweat equity, with social organization, is uh, what we want to open up here. So obviously, these lightweight frames, which in, in, in the context of the houses that are recycled, the garage doors, the joists, the pallet racks of wood, they become the hinges, the hinges that enable the strengthening not only of these spaces, but also visualize in some way the actual collaborative processes in uh, creating more nuanced relationship between public and private environments. So this is a scaffold system that we've been uh, uh, producing uh, in order to uh, engage this particular neighborhood. Uh, we think in infrastructure, uh, through social organization. This is another compelling. Of course, it's obvious already that the yellow slides are some of the main uh, frameworks, okay, conceptually for our practice. Uh, how can we rethink infrastructure through, in fact, that social contingency? I know that you've already seen this video endlessly here at the Architectural Association, but for me it's still uh, uh, very compelling to see it in terms of, again, visualizing the negotiation of time, space, and resources uh, which is that, that, that trade. How, how many of you have seen this? Uh, or probably all of you. Or, uh, anyway, for me it's still compelling to see, you know, of course many of us working with this topic, you know, tend to be blamed for romanticizing precariousness, poverty, but the challenge is can we in fact reproduce uh, or translate or take to another scale this possibility as uh, this uh, immediacy, this sort of, uh, again, creative intelligence in enabling the transformation of space uh, by, in fact, not formalistic, uh, 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 how would you call it, algorithmic-based uh, parametrics, in a sense, which is final. We should experiment formally in architecture. But without engaging the social, economic, and political contingencies that would make those systems meaningful, I think uh, we are not uh, advancing the debate. So I'm thinking, can this socioeconomic contingency be the device to rethink our formal systems? Of course, that's a hugely difficult, but that's a challenge to many of us engaging uh, these issues. That opens up the second flow, which is the one moving from uh, south uh, to north. I, I mentioned the north to south, which is a flow of waste, and how the conflicts embedded in that transaction have been inspirational for our practice now. The impact of immigrants in the reimagining, re but also ultimately physical transformation of American neighborhoods. This is really the basis of our project in, in San Diego. Uh, as, as, as it is, I think, in any uh, global city at the moment, I think uh, Jorge, George already mentioned it, is what is the impact of the informal in the official city? Probably that's more compelling than the slums themselves, which are automatically they're already giving us the clues. But we are still not understanding how to negotiate a new type of uh, political agenda and engaging the kind of transformations that happen in many neighborhoods, in the United States at least. So I'm interested in the visualization in very lyrical ways of this phenomena, by the way, this has been part of our project, the telling of stories, literally, uh, of retrofit. So imagine that the most trafficked border in the world, 60 million people cross uh, between San Diego and Tijuana officially, uh, not one single land use map exists between these two cities. So we decided to very uh, simply put it together, just to, to again be lyrical about it and, and engage politicians. And, uh, uh, I'm saying this because again, uh, in many of our schools, we have, uh, even though I think it's been essential that we, the last 10, 15 years, have returned 
uh, to the kind of complexity of the palimpsest, uh, the kind of force field, uh, the vectors that really construct the city, the representations that emerge from our research are hugely complex. Very difficult to be accessible by community activists or politicians. They are just for our conversation, basically. So I've been interested in challenging the, the, the need, again, to think of all the modes of representation that can be uh, very simple, very accessible. I don't know if simple is the word. How can we make complexity? A simple image that can really speak of complexity is an important thing. Uh, when I showed this to the city council member that is part of this neighborhood, he was really engaged in this, what we, how we began to work together. Basically, the land use to the north, which is the big chunks of land use in San Diego, right? Typical suburban Southern California environments, uh, bedroom communities, malls, little slivers of retail, but in, in this like, two and very large kind of scale. And to the south, what I already hopefully gave you evidence of, the high pixelation of use in Tijuana, more compacted, uh, uh, and more uh, alternative. And so the argument has been that this confetti of alternative uses has begun to infiltrate itself into the largeness uh, of South California. So one uh, aspect here or, uh, uh, has been to suggest that the future of Southern California depends on the pixelation of the large with the small, not only through program programmatic contingency, but other forms of ownership. Uh, and because when this confetti hits the ground, it actually touches many of those marginal neighborhoods. In fact, the very levy towns where the houses are uh, taken from to Tijuana, the few houses that uh, remain, that, that save themselves, are retrofitted by immigrants. So it's a kind of, I, I would call it the kind of, if I had time to write a book, I would call it the kind of double destiny of Levittown. One to be recycled by Tijuana, the other one to be altered by immigrants. Uh, so when these parcels are altered basically by immigrants, I'm suggesting again what is obvious to all of you, is they begin to inject into these small parcels uh, an, an, an informal economy into, into the garage, an, an illegal building uh, as in a kind of granny flat uh, to support an extended family, all these negotiations with limits, with boundaries, private, public, and resources begin to pixelate these environments, these communities, these neighborhoods with, again, informal economies and densities, the typical socioeconomic economic, uh, plugins that also repeat in Tijuana, uh, and making these parcels incredibly interesting. Uh, so here the story is about an illegal Buddha, uh, because I've been tracking some case studies that are really interesting sociologically, uh, uh, organizationally speaking, and it tells the story of one of those uh, post-war bungalows that saved itself, did not travel to Tijuana, and in the last 30 years uh, became a Buddhist temple in this neighborhood. Uh, and not only the interesting adaptations and retrofitting of the parcel to, su to support activities interesting, but particularly what is interesting is that this Buddhist temple becomes the agency that negotiates, translates, deploys, redistributes social economic resources but also pedagogical systems, cultural systems. I'm interested in the role of these agencies in becoming the devices, uh, the kind of informal city halls of sorts, to translate the informal dynamics into systems that are more coherent and more political, more translatable. They are the representatives of the invisible, in this sense. That's the kind of mandala, right? They, they, they actually, they, are, they, 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 they absorb and, 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 and bundle. They bundle these efforts into something more uh, uh, visual and more operational. One of those uh, aspects of translation has to enable the rethinking of density. I know that this has been the topic forever, but I think we continue to uh, miss the point. I think I don't want to sound awfully pretentious, thinking that I'm giving all the answers or whatever, but for me it has been obvious that density continues to be measured by all of us, by any institutions across governance, uh, academia or development by a, in a way, kind of stupid equation. An amount of things per acre. It doesn't matter how many studies are done about this, isn't that the, 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 the measuring point? An amount of objects per acre, an amount of people per acre. This is the first thing I was thinking we need to completely question. Because in these neighborhoods, density could be measured differently. Density here is measured by an amount of socioeconomic exchanges per acre. Socioeconomic exchanges per acre. Can we, in fact, visualize the actual activity of that Buddhist temple in the, in the management and the 
uh, enabling of resources and political collaborations and so on. That is, I think, is a, is a challenge for not only sociology to rethink itself, but also the relationship to architecture, to spatial practice, to modes of representation, obviously. So it's, 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 it's uh, evident that one aspect has been that these efforts in these neighborhoods make these neighborhoods sites of cultural production and of socio-economic relations. Uh, this is something that I, be, uh, I already years ago, when all my friends were uh, building in Dubai and China, and I was working in these uh, small neighborhoods, and I was thinking uh, as the intelligentsia, the creative intelligentsia, flocked in mass uh, to construct the, the dream castles of these global cities, and in so doing, camouflaging the very politics and economics that became controversial now, uh, I think that these environments, uh, again, for me became uh, obviously a point in a very different direction. So the future of the city, primarily today, depends less on buildings, but more on the fundamental reorganization of social economic relations. And that does not mean that the architectural association will have to close, <laughs> but what it means that probably the, the role of design needs to be expanded, I think, in enabling the designing of uh, political and economic processes, because that's what the Buddhist temple has done. Uh, and in so doing, com uh, com problematize, I think, the relationship of these epicenters of development. It's obvious that for the last years, downtowns everywhere became the places, the bubbles of wealth. Uh, uh, in the United States, at least, because of tax increment law, uh, many of those taxes on the, of the towers, the luxury condo towers, the luxury hotels, and office towers, all those taxes uh, trickle into downtown only. And so that made these environments hugely uh, wealthy. The periphery in the United States became equally as expensive because of the need of huge infrastructure. It is those neighborhoods located in this middle zone, uh, these mid cities, what remain uh, still uh, uh, unaccounted for, uh, the marginal neighborhoods in the United States. And it is here where many of these diasporas from Africa, Latin America, and Asia are settled, conven conveniently serving as a service community for the wealthy downtown and the periphery. Uh, the point is that if the mid-city neighborhoods have transformed so radically in the last years, what will happen in the next 60 years to the rest of the city? I mean, I think that the anticipation, the transformation uh, of the city in, in, in density is fundamental uh, as well. I call these creative acts of citizenship, by the way. I mean, I live in the United States, just like in England, where we have become hugely fearful of immigrants. And I think that uh, to amplify the role, at least in California, of immigrants and the alteration of these spaces suggests a very different notion of citizenship, less grounded on this, uh, how I call it, uh, official document that makes you belong to a nation state that may be uh, amplified as what it should be and was from the beginning. Citizenship is a creative act that reorganizes uh, political uh, and economic protocols, and of course, uh, spatial uh, conditions as well. Um, I don't know, I, I knew that I was going to run into trouble in terms of the time, but uh, there is this, um, I'm tempted to maybe step, uh, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. The point is that there is this other story that is really that became really uh, revelatory for me, it has to do with leftover spaces in Southern California. You can imagine this is a place of sprawl, huge fragmentation of the territory in terms of enclaves uh, that are uh, separated from each other. But many of those uh, leftover spaces uh, are still conceived uh, by artists as just simply poetic fragments, and we need to amplify that they are political. Uh, uh, spaces that were really uh, remnants of a stupid policy. And so uh, there is a variety of policies that we've been engaging to in public space in San Diego and Tijuana. A paper streets is one of those uh, leg legislature, pieces of legislature that is very stupid. These are streets that were never built because when the planners arrived to the places, they realized that there was topography. So it will be too expensive to, uh, so these are paper streets that are invisible. And I, I make an argument for the visualization of these this forgotten pieces of infrastructure uh, to rethink uh, public uh, uh, space. Uh, paper freeways, these are freeways that were never built and remain leftover spaces. And of course, people have begun to encroach into them to produce soft programming uh, activity. Uh, at the same time, these uh, empty zones are surrounded by community-based NGOs artist groups sometimes, elementary schools. I'm interested in how architects become interlocutors 
somehow uh, one way of describing what, what I do is, which I, I think is true, is a sort of cultural pimp. I don't know what would be the word in, 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 in that, but facilitating relationships across.